The Esperance region is home to some of the oldest and most unique historical buildings in Western Australia. These buildings tell of the dramatic change that the colonial period brought to the land. Stories of community and conflict, tragedy and hope, and stories of survival in some of the most unlikely places. Balbinia sits in the middle of nowhere, in a wild and remote area that holds dangers even for the most experienced of bushmen. From the comforts of modern society, it's difficult to imagine just how hard it would have been to establish a home in such a location. And yet the family who established this property were not ordinary pastoralists. They were a widowed schoolmistress and her two adult children well-educated, but inexperienced in living on the land. Through grit and determination, they turned the property into a small oasis, with a dam, a garden complete with rambling roses, and two beautiful historic buildings that, despite the odds, are still standing today. The story of Balbinia starts when a young couple, Emily and Henry Brooks, decided to emigrate from Ireland to Australia with their one-year-old son, John Paul. Emily, who had been married at just 16 years of age, was pregnant with her second child. The young family, accompanied by Emily's older sister, Mary Donovan, boarded a ship in Plymouth they were on board, still in the harbour, when Emily gave birth to her daughter, Sarah Teresa, on the 19th of September, 1850. Five days later, the ship set sail for Melbourne. The family settled in Geelong, where Henry intended to establish himself as a farmer. Tragically, Within months of arriving in Australia, Henry contracted typhoid, and in April 1851, he died. Emily was now a widow, living in a new country with two very young children at the age of 18. In 1854, Mary Donovan married Thomas Eddles, an established pastoralist. Emily Brooks worked as a governess for a while and then opened a small private school, which she ran from at least 1855 to 1863. After John Paul finished school, he went to work for his uncle, Thomas Eddles, as a jackaroo. Then in 1873, he rented a property east of Melbourne and established a dairy farm. The family had little income during this time, and their expenses were quite high, so the farm proved to be unsuccessful, only lasting a year. During that time, they saw the new Western Australian Land Acts advertised, offering free leases of 100,000 acres for five years, with one year free of charges to travel, and they made plans to emigrate to Western Australia. In 1874, they arrived in Albany, which was the first settlement in WA, and bustling with a population of more than 1,500 people at the time. The area was already home to the Menang Nyunga people, who called it Kinjaling, meaning place of rain. The Menang people have lived in the area for many thousands of years. While the Brooks family was in Albany, they met with Campbell Taylor, who had recently established a pastoral station called Lynburn 
at Thomas River to the east of Esperance Bay. Campbell told them this area had good grazing land. Carly Florison is an Esperance-based historian who's researching the Brooks family for a book she's writing. I find their story just so fascinating because they were quite cultured, quite well-educated people, they had quite a comfortable life and it wasn't that they always had an easy life, they'd had tragedy before in their lives, but they were city people essentially and they moved from this city to a place that was in the middle of nowhere. They were just absolutely in the middle of the outback in this area where there were so few European people living and they had a life that was really quite difficult. They faced so many hardships living in, in this area. We don't have very many photos um, of the family, but because they were well educated, they wrote a lot, especially Sarah and John Paul. And so we've got some of their letters, we've got articles to the newspapers that they wrote and journal entries. And because of that, we have a really good sense of what their lives were like. The family started to prepare for the long overland journey ahead, purchasing some supplies and loading the furniture they'd brought across from Victoria onto a cart. So we know a lot of details about that journey thanks to a really amazing newspaper article that was published in The Herald, a Fremantle newspaper. They had all of their possessions on a heavy cart that was drawn by a horse and that included some pigs in a crate and a cockatoo in a cage and a spare cockatoo cage just in case they caught another cockatoo along the way. They also had two dogs with them and both Sarah and Mrs Brooks carried parasols that were van dyked around the edges and lined with pink and green calico. It would have been really an amazing sight to see them setting off on this journey. Should they be so fortunate as to reach Esperance Bay, it will be at the cost of much suffering and privation, but it is quite within the bounds of probability they will perish. There were few European settlements between Albany and their intended destination, and they had to walk the whole way with all of their belongings on the cart through uncleared bush, learning many bush skills along the way. They stayed with the Chain family at Cape Rich, the Wellstead family at Bremer Bay, and the Dunn family at Phillips River. They then passed by Stokes Inlet, near where the Moyer family had settled. The Dempsters, living on Woodgery Nyungar land at Esperance Bay, recorded their arrival in May and stated that they were gentle folk and totally unfitted for such a venture in that harsh, waterless country. The family continued to Campbell Taylor's property, Lynburn, which was the first property to the east of Esperance Bay. As Sarah later wrote, we left Albany with the intention of traveling through to Eucla, but as we progressed, grave doubts were expressed by persons who had been to Eucla by sea as to the advisability of our going there at all owing to the extreme scarcity of water. When they got to Campbell Taylor's station at Thomas River, Emily, their mother, was so ill that she couldn't continue the journey. And so they decided that Sarah and Emily would stay at Lindburn Station and John Paul would go on on his own to Eucla just to see if there was any suitable land that they could settle in that area. And we've got some excerpts from the journal that Sarah wrote. After making us as comfortable as circumstances would permit, he started for Eucla on the afternoon of August the 3rd, 1874. Dear Mama was in bed, unable to rise, but I watched the party start, not without a lump in my throat, as I thought of my dear brother going forth to encounter the dangers of fatigue, thirst, and we knew not what besides, and we two poor women left alone among strangers, helpless. 
John Paul decided to travel to Eucla with William Lennox, a stockman he'd employed at Lynburn, and Jackie, an Aboriginal guide. He also took two other men, Jim Davis and Fred Main, at Campbell's request. Two weeks after the men left for Eucla, Sarah and Emily were shocked when two policemen arrived searching for Davis and Maine, who were actually escaped convicts trying to make their way to South Australia. On the first day of the journey, John Paul discovered that Davis and Maine had very few rations with them. While they were very short of food, their greatest problem was lack of water. On the 30th day, they met with a group of Aboriginal men who led them to a source of water, saving their lives. It took the men 39 days to reach Eucla, and upon arrival, they realised there were already two parties in residence there who had already taken up the best pastoral land. Davis and Maine carried on east, convincing Jackie to go with them. John Paul and Lennox started their long journey back to Lynburn without Jackie's help. On the return journey they were even hungrier and they had much more difficulty finding water. So again they were saved by another Aboriginal tribe that helped them along the way but it was still a very difficult return journey and in fact they both only barely survived. Lennox was unable to continue and so John Paul rode on ahead to go and get some supplies and this is Sarah speaking. She says, On the morning of October 15th I was up early and heard a feeble but familiar voice say, Aren't you up yet? And rushing to open the door I saw Paul in such a state as I hope never to see anyone again, much less him. John Paul got some supplies and went back to Lennox who had resorted to desperate measures to survive while he'd been alone. And Lennox was so hungry at that time that he boiled and ate his sheepskin saddlecloth just for something to eat. The weary travellers had covered over 1,200 kilometres to Eucla and back, an incredible feat in such difficult terrain. In 1875, John Paul applied for a lease of 10,000 acres at Israelite Bay, stretching along the coastline from Point Dempster to Point Malcolm. He later extended the holding by 4,000 acres to cover the Mulburn Up rock hole to the west. He built a house at Mulburn Up for Emily and Sarah, stocking the land with sheep he'd purchased from Campbell Taylor. By this time, he'd become friends with the Ponton brothers and John Sharp, who'd arrived in the area around the same time as the Brookses. John Paul and Stephen Ponton set out on an expedition in June 1875, taking with them an Aboriginal guide known as Black Ben. They travelled inland and were away for three months, but didn't find any suitable land. In 1876, the telegraph line, which would connect Western Australia to the Eastern States, reached Israelite Bay. With his pastoral efforts not achieving great success, John Paul took up a position as the first linesman employed by the Israelite Bay Telegraph Station, checking and repairing the lines. The Brooks family left their small home at Melbourne Up and allowed their leases to lapse. John Paul built a two-room stone house near the telegraph station and the family moved in, naming it Waratah. The telegraph station meant that a small community grew in the area, with linesmen, telegraphists and the station master all with their families moving in. John Paul worked for the telegraph line for seven years, 
Meanwhile, the rest of the family's possessions were sent across from Victoria, including Sarah's piano, which was landed on the beach at Israelite Bay. When Sarah's piano was shipped over from Victoria, they unloaded it onto the sand at Israelite Bay. They didn't have a way to get the piano from the beach to Waratah at the time. And so the piano apparently sat on the beach for several weeks. And Sarah would go down there sometimes and play the piano at the beach until they were able to transport it to her house, where she often played the piano for the people who lived in the area to entertain them. In 1883, John Paul took up a lease of 20,000 acres, 100 kilometres inland from Israelite Bay, on land where the Naju people had lived for many thousands of years. He called the new property Balbinia. Alexander Forrest had camped at that location in 1871 on one of his exploratory journeys, building a stone cairn which is still present today. John Paul quit his job as a linesman and moved to the new lease the following year. Sarah stayed on at Waratah on her own, with Emily moving to Balbinia with John Paul, who had a stone cottage built for his mother there. Nearby, they built a stone shed with a room for John Paul and a water reservoir. Roger Robertson is a stonemason who has devoted many years to preserving several old buildings in this remote area. I'm a retired stonemason and my hobby has always been restoring old buildings out here. This one first. <laughs> Here, yeah, and just you in just a big rebu pile. rebuilt it from the. Original. We did bring in a bit of extra stone for the corners. Yep. Because being a stonemason, I build them a lot tighter right. than the original builders did. That, that's why it fell apart so quickly. It was built very loose. Yeah. And only right. mudded the walls. Yep. Just, mm -hmm. As soon as the water got in there, it was just gone. Yep. Oh, wow. So, do you reckon two different people built the two? Well, I know that Fred Stein built the, the store shed yep. and the water tank. Okay. Yep. And he may have built this too. Right. He, because he was contracted no. to build it. Yep. Mm. But the style of work on yep. John Paul's room suggests that he might have built that himself. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's a bit rough around the edges. No, is no, it? it's a lot better. It's oh, okay. His, his work, yeah. he has only granite. So this part of it is John Paul's yeah. room? Yeah. You see he's built it. And on, that's the you see tank. He's built it on top of the water tank. Oh, yeah, I see. So he only yeah. had to build the fireplace and two walls. The water tank was built first. As part of the shed. And then his room. It was obviously ah. built after. So you rebuilt part of it because Just it was this a room. Bit... Okay. Because this was completely collapsed, the whole thing. Yeah, wow. Come back to the chimney. This is the room that John Paul actually lived in. He had his bed up the back corner, uh, yep. a table a chair, fireplace, right. designed for cooking of course. It's lovely, isn't it? The whole it? room was rendered as you can see by the remnants. This was a store shed. It was a place where you could, he ran it as a general store where you could buy boots and blankets and ammunition. I just use it as a 
a bit of a museum for a lot of stuff from out this mm. area. In 1883, the chief botanist of Victoria, Baron Ferdinand von Mueller, wrote to the West Australian newspaper, asking that they appeal to our settlers in outlying districts to aid him in his botanical researches by collecting and sending to him botanical specimens of various plants so that he could catalogue and classify them. Sarah saw this advertisement and began collecting plants from around Mount Ragged and Israelite Bay. Nicole Hodgson is a writer doing a PhD on Sarah Brooks's prolific collection of botanical specimens for von Mueller. He was really trying to document the whole of Australian flora and so he needed collectors everywhere, just you know, collecting in every corner of Australia. Over that time, something like 3,000 people were sending him plants. Many of them might have only collected 10 specimens or even less than 10. Seems like she worked in partnership with him for 13 years and sent him you know, close to 1,000 specimens. Hugely significant was the fact that she was collecting right at the edge of the Southwest Australian floristic region. And Mueller was one of the first people to actually identify that a very distinct set of flora existed in the southwest. So her living at that boundary and collecting so comprehensively, I think would have made a huge contribution to him understanding biogeography. Von Mueller named two species after Sarah in recognition of her contributions. The Hakea. Brookiana. Unfortunately, that was actually reclassified as a subspecies, so it's Hakea obliqua, subspecies obliqua, so that doesn't have her name on it anymore. The other plant is a Scovola brookiana. It's only found around Mount Ragged, so um, yeah, difficult to come across. I don't think that many have been found. She sent so many specimens over so many years. Where she was, the tiny little cottage, I can kind of imagine her room being half filled with her specimens, you know, all being pressed and dried and, and collected up. It must have really taken over her life for that point. John Paul collected some specimens as well, but the scale of Sarah's collection and her commitment to the science behind her work makes it an extremely valuable time capsule today. With such a rapidly changing climate, clearing, the impact of dieback, all of the landscape pressures that European settlement has placed upon our country, you know, having those snapshots of time when Europeans were just starting to change the landscape are just so vital and so important. In 1897, Waratah was destroyed by a fire. Some of the people from the telegraph station helped Sarah to get her possessions out of the house, so all her goods and furniture, including the piano, were saved. After this, Sarah moved her belongings and the piano to Balbinia and lived there with her mother in the four by five metre room. That little cottage, she moved in there with her mother. Uh, it was pretty crowded. <laughs> It looks like she had a lot of her, you know, tea chests and stuff all, yeah. all on the front veranda as well, yeah. eh? That's this post. Yep. And you can see here, that's the door. Yeah, So right. the shop's obviously taken from a little bit over that way. So this would have been growing along the, like along, along the here, veranda? Along this set part of it. They grew their own vegetables. Yep. And they had, uh, they did kill their own medication as well yep. as having tin meat. Yeah. Um, what do you reckon they would have grown? What sort of veggies? 
Oh, no, they love their artichokes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's still the remnants of them down there. It's really? the last, largest infestation of wild artichokes in Australia. Really? <laughs> The veggie garden down there was uh, a lot of work. It was very large, it was probably at least a quarter acre block, and it was very well fenced. It used to have two mulberry trees, massive rose bush, and a fig tree. The drain off the rock, big part of the rock was catchment, and he had all these trenches through the veggie garden to, to run the water, and then the overflow went into a dam. The rose at the grave has been recently planted. It's the cutting of the original rose, which is up next to the mulberry tree. Orchard was established in 1883, so I'd say that rose bush and those mulberry trees were planted in the early 1880s. It's grown a lot in the last 30, 40 years that I've been looking at it. A lot of cuttings have gone all over. Like my ex-wife got one, my brother's got one. <laughs> The Brooks family were not entirely isolated in the remote area they called home. The Pontons and John Sharp took up several leases in the area, and despite the huge distances between properties, the families took every opportunity to socialise. Another neighbour was Henry Dimer, a German sailor who had jumped ship near Albany before coming to the area to work for Campbell Taylor. Henry then worked as a shepherd for John Paul at Balbinia for three years. John Paul eventually had to give him sheep in lieu of wages, as he couldn't afford to pay him. In May 1899, Henry married Topsy Whitehand, and in 1902, they took up a lease around 60 kilometres from Balbinia, at Nanambinia. They, and later their children, often visited the Brooks family and vice versa, lending supplies and helping each other with various chores. The Brooks family had good relationships with the local Aboriginal people, the Naju people, who lived near Balbinia. John Paul employed Aboriginal people as shepherds and both he and Sarah made an effort to learn from and understand their culture. Sarah was later quoted as saying of land leases, We soon found that the government had been very liberal with something which did not belong to it. Old Noah, Old Friday and the other leaders of a more ancient race were the real owners whose race had lived in undisputed possession and were not inclined to waive their rights to anyone. Unfortunately, Despite all their efforts, they really didn't have much luck as pastoralists. They had so many difficulties like um, dingoes, plagues of rabbits, poison plants that affected some of the flocks of sheep as well. And so while they were able to make enough of a living to survive out in that quite difficult place, they didn't become wealthy, they weren't able to build up big flocks or anything like that, which is my sense that, you know, that was what they wanted. In 1907, Emily fell from a horse and broke her hip. She was 77 years old. From that time onwards, she was bedridden, on a sofa at Balbinia, with Sarah acting as her nurse. On the 27th of May 1911, during the night, Emily died from bronchitis, three days short of her 79th birthday. John Paul had just left for a trip to Israelite Bay with his buggy pulled by three donkeys. The next morning, Sarah began to walk after him to let him know the news of their mother's death. And fortunately, his donkeys had strayed during the night, so she was able to catch up with him 11 kilometres from home. They went back to Balbinia 
and buried Emily near the orchard. Sarah continued living at Balbinia after her mother's death. She was described by Stephen Ponton's granddaughter, Amy Crocker, as being little, slim and dainty, her blue eyes always alight with interest, ready to smile or be sympathetic. She was also described as the perfect lady, very cultured and beautifully spoken. In August 1927, Sarah became sick, so the Pontons took her to the Norseman Hospital, where she stayed for a month. Following this incident, in October of 1927, Sarah went to Perth with Bertha and Barney Dimer. She stayed for six weeks, and during the time she was in Perth, she was interviewed by the Sunday Times for a newspaper article. They recently came for a trip to Perth, the first undertaken in 54 years, Miss Brooks of Balbinia, a princess among the lady pioneers of this state. Delicately reared, her mother a daughter of an aristocratic family, well educated and speaking two or three European languages fluently, Miss Brooks could scarcely be said to be possessed of the early training generally regarded as necessary for a frontier life. Well, this was the first time she'd ever been to Perth and it was really her first trip anywhere in 50 years. So she had the opportunity to do a few things that she didn't get the chance to do before, such as getting her hair permed, get a studio photo taken. She went to the pictures, to, to the cinema for the first time and she got to ride on a tram for the first time as well. One of the things that she said most surprised her about Perth was the noise. And I can just imagine, coming from Balbinia, it just must have been shocking the amount of noise that was in the city. Coming back to civilization after 50 years, I was frequently asked what struck me most. And always I replied, the beauty of the flowers. The following year, Henry Dimer and his daughter Annie went to visit Sarah at Balbinia, only to find her bedridden and paralyzed. John Paul was there, but she was reportedly in bad condition when the Dimers arrived. They took Sarah back to Nanambinya in Henry's Model T Ford, and the next day, Stephen Ponton's son, Will, took her to Norseman in their Buick. On the 23rd of September, 1928, nearly nine weeks after being admitted to hospital, Sarah died at the age of 78. She was buried in the Norseman Cemetery. After Sarah's death, John Paul continued to live at Balbinia alone. By this time, his flock of sheep had dwindled significantly, partly due to dingoes and rabbits. He still travelled long distances, riding his bicycle to Balladonia, a distance of nearly a hundred kilometres to collect the mail. He also had donkeys and a wagon for transport, but it was apparently easier and faster to travel by bicycle. In 1929, Henry Dimer bought John Paul's remaining sheep, leaving him with just 14 for meat. The Dimer family continued to check in on him frequently after Sarah's death as he was very isolated. But he did have an indigenous helper, Sambo, I think they called him. He was very faithful to, to John. They were probably very good friends. I don't know, there's not, not much written on him, except times when, uh, like, John would get crook and, and uh, Dimers would turn up and say, why didn't you send Sambo back with a the, with the donkey <laughs> to come and get help? Well, it was all right. <laughs> I think he was very independent. In May of 1930, Henry Dimer visited Balbinia and couldn't find John Paul. After searching along a fence line about a kilometre and a half from the house, he was found alive but very weak. He'd collapsed and been unable to return home, so had been in the open for at least two days. Henry and Carl Dimer cared for him at Balbinia but he died during the night of the 20th of May. <laughs> 
He was buried in the orchard, near where his mother was believed to be buried. Neither John Paul nor Sarah ever married, and we don't have any indication that either of them had any romantic relationships. Although there is something of a local legend that suggests that Sarah did receive a couple of proposals of marriage, but Emily wouldn't allow Sarah to marry anybody who had less than £10,000 income which was, of course, a huge amount of money for that time. And so the people who lived in that area weren't wealthy people, and so she didn't marry any of them. The family's leases and their freehold land at Balbinia reverted to Crown land. As they didn't have any family members to inherit their goods, they were put up for tender and purchased by Henry Dimer. Some of the family's belongings are now on display at the Esperance Museum, including a shepherd's crook that John Paul used while caring for his sheep, some small, beautifully made pieces of furniture that they brought with them from Victoria, and a bonnet that belonged to Sarah. There is also a chair on display that John Paul built from salvaged materials from a ship called the Bateau Bassi, wrecked off Alexander Bay in 1880, a testament to his ingenuity when it came to reusing materials. Over time, the Dimer family took the roofing iron off the buildings to reuse elsewhere, which resulted in them deteriorating rapidly and many of Sarah's paintings were lost when Bertha Dimer's house at Rawlinna burnt down in the 1950s. In 1993, the buildings at Balbinia were restored by the Landcare and Environment Action Program under the guidance of Roger. I went over there in 92 and I spent a few weeks there by myself. The weekends that people come out and give me a hand. We've got a LEAP program organised, volunteers. Uh, on the doll. In the, the six months we were there, we finished roofing the shed and rebuilt the little cottage which was completely collapsed. It was just a pile of rocks this high, <laughs> with a lot of posts sticking out of it. <laughs> Brooks's lime kiln he had for burning lime to bank building um, stood for many, many years unfired until someone put a match in it, destroyed it, but some of it was burnt properly enough so we excavated the middle of it at the LEAP program and put that lime back into the cottage. The Brooks family didn't find the wealth they hoped for when they moved to remote Western Australia. But their story is one of survival in the face of adversity. Despite the difficulties, they didn't give up, and Sarah certainly didn't allow the hardships to dull her intelligent, artistic, and gentle nature. She was always happy. And when she was asked why, she says, well, we don't get visitors very often, so I'm not gonna show them a sad face. <laughs> it was a good outlook. They had a good outlook on life. You now times might've been hard, but visitors, all sunshine. And while they were not successful pastoralists, they achieved something that many of their peers did not. They were curious and interested in learning about their surroundings in this new home. The words they wrote and the botanical specimens they collected live on after their deaths, helping us to know more about the time and place where they lived. quite cultured, genteel sort of people, and they were quite ambitious people as well. They wanted to make something of their lives and to establish a, a settlement somewhere, which is what they did, even if they had to go to great lengths to do that. Balbinia is still standing, a remote but beautiful monument 
to remarkable people whose achievements live on today.